So we've got um, Dr. Michael Bentley with us. He's the Director of Training and Education for the National Pest Management Association, our counterparts. How's the weather over there, Michael? <laughs> Uh, I don't think it's quite as hot as it is where you are right now. Um, it's pretty warm, but yeah, I think you're taking the brunt of the heat wave right now. So yeah, we're just not prepared for it in this country. You see, it, 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 aircon doesn't really exist apart from maybe in offices and stuff. So yeah, any of us working at home, it's just yeah, it's crazy. But we like to moan about the weather, so hey, it's something <laughs> to, to talk about. So, um, but thank you for being with us today. Um, yeah, great. Do you know what? Without further ado, I'll let you do some introductions if you yourself want to and share your presentation. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, bear with me just a second. It's hard to talk and chew bubblegum at the same time, <laughs> let alone work technology. So can you see my slides okay? I can. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, um, thank you so much, Natalie. And thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to be able to present here this morning or this afternoon for you. Um, it's about 540 in the morning for me here. So bright and early, but I'm a morning person. So this is perfect for me. Um, so, as Natalie mentioned, I'm the Director of Training and Education for the National Pest Management Association, and uh, really excited to talk to you today about a unique invasive species that we've dealt with here in the southern region of the United States. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about that ant. It's the tawny crazy ant. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit of a, an exaggerated introduction about the ant and about me. So you can see here on the right, um, that is actually me back in graduate school. I've always been a very professional individual, as you can see by the uh, photo here. Um, so this ant, the Tawny Crazy Ant, was actually the ant that I focused on for my PhD research. Um, so what I focused on was understanding what it is that allows invasive species to become so successful in regions where they're not native to. So this ant was a great example, um, a, an individual ant that came into the Florida area. So far, far, far south in the United States, very tropical, probably feel, feels very much normally like what you're experiencing right now. Um, <clears throat> very hot, very humid climate, ideal area for if there's an accidental introduction of an ant like this for the ant to do very well. What I'm doing in this photo, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes, is I'm actually counting ants. So any any of those dramatized TV shows you see where there's all this very cool science going on in the background, that's TV. This is probably more like what you typically can expect inside of an entomology research lab. Somebody that looks very cool like this, wearing some really awesome glasses, uh, helping to magnify the individual tiny little ants. And I'm counting each individual ant and weighing those ants out. And I'll tell you why I'm doing that here in a little bit. Um, but so what the plan is in the short amount of time that I have is to give you a quick background on where the ant came from and its pest status in the United States, why it's such an important pest, even though it's only found in one specific region currently, um, where it could potentially move to, what that could even mean for you all. Uh, I'm going to do some of that through talking through a case study that we actually dealt with during my research. Um, and then I'm going to wrap up with uh, a little bit of a, a, an overview with some lessons that we've learned from the specific ant species um, and what we're hoping to be able to apply with this ant moving forward. So the introduction of the Tawny Crazy Ant into the United States is a bit of a complicated mess, and that's mainly because it looks almost identical to another invasive ant species that doesn't create quite the same disturbance issues and ecological impacts that the, the, the Tawny Crazy Ant has. So the Latin name for the Tawny Crazy Ant is Nylandaria fulva. It's, you don't need to really know that, just understand that this specific ant, as you can see in the third bullet down below, has had a lot of different common names over the years. And that's partly what helped to contribute to some of the confusion. So when you hear nerds like me, scientists lean really heavily into utilizing the Latin name of something. This is exactly why. No matter what part of the region in the United States or around the world that I am, if I say Nylandaria fulva, everybody knows what I'm talking about. But if I throw out terms like brown crazy ant, hairy crazy ant, or raspberry crazy ant, depending on what part of the country in the United States that I'm in, it could mean a very different ant species. In fact, even the term Caribbean crazy ant is actually used to refer to some of the confusion, two different crazy ant species um, that were introduced into the United States. So there's a lot of confusion when we use those common names. So I may uh, may refer to the Tawny crazy ant as Nylandaria fulva sometimes throughout the presentation, but that's just because 
I want you to know that I'm specifically talking about this ant species. But we first had a confirmed record of this ant in the United States, specifically down on the southern tip of Florida around 1950. If you look at the map on the right hand side of your screen there, um, you don't need to really know a whole lot about the map, just other than the green area is where this ant species is native to. Around the same area in South America that another notorious invasive ant species comes from, the red imported fire ant, which is globally one of the most ecologically damaging and potentially uh, threatening in terms of health impacts invasive ants around the world. So <clears throat> it comes from that same challenging region in South America where we've had some other uh, problematic ant species come from. We had a confirmed record of this ant around 1950s in Florida. There were some other potential confirmations of the ant species, but again, it looked very similar to another ant species. So what we ended up seeing was over a period of about 65 years, it's very difficult to confirm in the records unless we actually have an individual sample of the ant to know if that ant species was in fact Nylandaria fulva or if it was this other very similar looking uh, ant species that we dealt with. But what was really interesting about this introduction was how we actually were led to confirm that the tawny crazy ant Nylandaria fulva was in fact a different species. And that has a lot to do with all of you that are actually on this, on this presentation right now. Pest management professionals were largely uh, responsible for helping to determine uh, that this was an, in fact a different species. So you're looking at two different images here. The image on the left is the tawny crazy ant Nylandaria fulva. That's the star of the show for today. Um, the ant on the right, a little bit of a blurry image. I apologize about that. But that image there is of Nylandaria pubens, again, also called the, the Caribbean crazy ant. Um, they look almost identical, very, very similar in appearance. In fact, you actually have to count a few different hairs to be able to really tell the difference between the two. If you're using a microscope and you need to identify and differentiate samples when you have them in your hands, but it's very easy to tell the difference between them if you're looking at their behavior. And that's actually what makes the tawny crazy ant such a problematic ant species. So they're very similar in appearance, but their behavior is drastically different. And I mentioned to you that pest management professionals were largely responsible for uh, helping to differentiate and determine that there was in fact a different species. And that's because of this gentleman right here. This is Tom Raspberry. Uh, he, owns a, he owns and operates a pest control company out of Texas. And uh, so if you're looking at the map, that region in Florida where those introductions first started, if you draw uh, geographic lines straight across, you're going to see that Texas lines up with that. So similar climate is kind of what I'm trying to get to there. Uh, similar environment. He noticed that there were uh, several pockets where these what what everybody assumed were Caribbean crazy ants. Their behavior was totally different. Reproduction rates were through the roof. Um, total numbers of workers were in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, whereas Caribbean crazy ants, they can persist in an area, but numbers are usually in the thousands, maybe tens of thousands if you've got a very large uh, infestation that can cover a really large area, multiple hectares, multiple acres. But in this situation, he was noticing that there were areas that were absolutely physically overrun. You could not walk anywhere without being inundated and completely covered by these, these mystery crazy ants. So he knew right off the bat that there were so many differences, <clears throat> very important and notable differences in behavior between this species and what everybody assumed was this normal Caribbean crazy ant species. So it was his observations working with a local university that really helped to launch a, a deeper investigation into this. And fast forward through some boring science stuff where they use some genetic data and some other things to differentiate and to confirm um, <clears throat> that this was, in fact, a different species. So it's largely because this individual had a very, very solid understanding of what was normal in his area and what wasn't. He wasn't necessarily a professional ant expert. He didn't understand the nuances and intricacies of this complicated identification on how to find these monomers and and all these different, like really weird taxonomic characters to be able to differentiate these. He simply knew what was normal behavior for ant species in his area and what wasn't. And he was able to use that to lead other researchers to get to this point. So 
Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that point a little bit later, but something I, I want to make sure that everybody understands, so incredibly valuable here that a pest management professional was the one that really helped us with this. So <clears throat> we'll go through really quick, uh, talk a little bit about identification, some of the biology, and then we'll get into that really fun part uh, with the case study. So the uh, the tawny crazy ant, as we can see here, it is uh, what we refer to as a monomorphic species. Basically, what that means is all of the workers are about the same size. So we've got polymorphic ants, uh, maybe like a carpenter ant species or a fire ant species, where you can have workers that are very small and workers that are very large. In this case, tawny crazy ants, monomorphic. So all of the workers are about the same size, about three millimeters in length. So not an incredibly large ant species. Their antenna um, and their behaviors are very similar to most other species that we refer to as the crazy ants. So these crazy ants, as the name implies, they move around all crazy-like. Um, they don't form those clearly defined foraging trails like we would traditionally see with some other native ant species. They, they almost seem to just kind of <clears throat> wander around aimlessly, very fast, very erratic. And also their antenna tend to be very, very long. So that's another key giveaway in addition to the behavior. These ant species luckily don't have a stinger, but they do have an acidopore. So when you're dealing with um, a large number of ant species, the acidopore is this tiny little opening at the very tip of the abdomen or the gaster. <clears throat> and it can produce a special type of acid and that the characteristics of that acid can differ between species. And when I first started working with this ant species for my PhD research, we didn't know very much about it because we were just getting to the point where we were confirming this was indeed a different ant species. So there was a lot of really cool things to do and to work on with this ant. And we're going to get to some of that and the implications of that acidopore here in just a second. Foraging behavior, much like many of our other successful invasive ant species, they tend to be opportunistic feeders, which means they can eat just about anything you throw at them, which means if you drop them in a new environment where they're not native to, it's very easy for them to find a food source. So that's a common characteristic that many invasive uh, pests of any kind share, that they can eat just about anything. Just think about it, if you're very selective in what you eat and you're dropped into a new area, it may be very difficult for you to find that one available food source, whereas for the tawny crazy ant, pretty much anything out there is gonna be a food source, whether it's local ant species, or uh, I'm sorry, native insects, um, as well as uh, plant feeding insects, that they can tend to and get sweets, sugary solutions and things like that from. They are incredibly aggressive, um, which was another huge problem with the sand species, major ecological impacts and concerns, which we'll mention here in just a few minutes. Um, but <clears throat> also they have really high recruitment, which means that if and when they do find a situation in which uh, you've got some workers that are in danger, they can release an alarm pheromone and you can have huge numbers of workers very quickly recruited to that area to help overwhelm, let's say, a competing ant species or something. And again, they also have a very high affinity for carbohydrates, which is the sugary solutions that are produced uh, from, you know, naturally from some plant species. Or as you can see in the two images here on your screen, the top image, we've got some ta uh, tawny crazy ant workers that are tending to some scale insects that are producing a sweet sugary solution for them. Then the bottom image there uh, is those individuals feeding on aphids, or uh, I'm sorry, the sugary solution from aphids. Now I mentioned that acidopore uh, has a pretty unique characteristic to it that is specific to the tawny crazy ant. And I also mentioned earlier that the tawny crazy ant comes from the same region as the red imported fire ant. We were learning a lot of really interesting things and mostly I was, I was very interested in trying to figure out what was creating the opportunities and allowing this invasive ant species to be so successful because once it was introduced, it seemed to explode across the southern region. And <clears throat> when it found an area where it was incredibly successful, numbers could reach into the millions. So completely covering an area. And one of the most interesting characters that was noted during its invasion in this in that around the time period of 2010 to 2014 was that the tawny crazy ant was actually displacing the red imported fire ant. The red imported fire ant, for anybody that's not familiar, again, as I mentioned before, is one of the most aggressive and ecologically damaging and notorious invasive ant species around the world. Since its introduction, it's, it's pretty much found almost in every single area that has a hospitable climate to it um, in every single country around the world. When it locates and, and it's, it's accidentally introduced into a region, it very quickly 
over uh, overpowers and outcompetes other native ant species for food resources, killing off native ant species and completely claiming a, 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 a habitat for its own. One of the ways that it does that is it has a stinger and it can produce an incredibly noxious and deadly um, uh, uh, poison that you can actually see right here in the very tip of the stinger of this red imported fire ant. The red imported fire ant is the larger ant here in image A. This is the tawny crazy ant in image B. So this is a this is a characteristic of the red imported fire ant. When it's threatened, it will do this, produce this droplet of of this venom, and the venom can then, if it contacts an insect, it will kill it. Um, what was interesting was that they found out that the tawny crazy ant, after being exposed to this venom, it could produce its own uh, acid from its acidophores and then cover its body with its own acid, and that completely neutralized this fire ant venom. So it was a really interesting uh, uh, discovery to find out exactly how and help us to better understand how this ant species was so successful in these areas where, uh, you know, on paper it shouldn't be. In terms of nesting behavior, again, a really important uh, behavior to note and to understand here because this was one of those key characteristics that differentiated this individual from the Caribbean crazy ant. You're seeing two uh, gifs or gifs, however you want to phrase it there. Um, that I took from an area that was infested by tawny crazy ants. You could see all of the tawny crazy ants all over my hand from just putting my hand down on the ground, but they're opportunistic nesters. So they're going to go into a nest in pretty much any area that they can find. Um, and uh, they can quickly move those nests around, which is a very, very important behavior for these individuals. So they can nest in almost any area that's protected and covered. They're also polygynous and polydomous, two fancy words that just mean they have multiple queens and they can establish multiple nest sites. So what that means in terms of reproduction is that they have the potential to explode. Their populations can, can uh, increase incredibly rapidly because the more reproductives you have, the more eggs that are being produced and you're starting to exponentially talk about um, increases in colony size. So what we saw with this ant species was pretty similar to what we typically see with other problematic invasive ants, such as like the Argentine ant, um, those other similar species in terms of reproduction rates, where we have a seasonal ant population that increases and in peaks in the summertime and then falls in the wintertime. And essentially what we're, what we're aiming for from a management perspective is we're trying to identify a way in which we could develop a treatment strategy and a control program targeted towards the invasive tawny crazy ant that would allow pest management professionals to effectively target and manage this pest early in the springtime before those populations um, got out of control. Because So think about that red line there as kind of that threshold. Because once you started to try to control the ant species after it crossed through that threshold, you're simply just treating the issues and you're not ever actually correcting the problem for the rest of the time. So you're, you're being more reactive throughout the rest of the season Whereas the key with this ant species is to be proactive. And the simple reason is, is right here. So if you think in terms of targeting the ant species in the winter and the spring, the total number of potential nest sites and reproductives are significantly smaller. Whereas once you get into the summertime, the pest population is so high, the amount of reproductives and nest sites are so incredibly high that it's, it could be effectively impossible in many cases to, to adequately achieve complete control of the sand species in areas where you're dealing with millions of individuals. So the goal here was to establish and develop a treatment protocol that would give pest management professionals the understanding and the tools to be able to effectively manage this completely uncontrollable pest species. <clears throat> So a little bit about the pest status before we get into the case study. Um, I mentioned that these individuals, the numbers are absolutely staggering. Um, and it's hard to describe uh, clearly what those numbers really look like. This picture here on the bottom right, that's not dirt piled up against the structure. Those are actually dead ants. And I mentioned to you earlier that as a graduate student, one of my important duties was to establish <clears throat> a baseline of, of how much dead ants weighed. So I was counting the ants in numbers of 10, 100, 1,000, uh, 10,000, counting them in these numbers so we could adequately weigh them. So we could go through and assess a total population density or an estimation of populations in an area when we dealt with something like this. Um, so we could better estimate uh, the potential ecological impacts and, and other sorts of things. So that's the reason why I was counting them. 
<clears throat> was because what you're seeing here, you got a situation which you've got hundreds of thousands of dead worker ants piled up against the side of a building. And that's because the individuals that uh, were uh, working inside this building went through and took it upon themselves to spray a contact insecticide, <clears throat> which isn't necessarily bad, but when not used correctly by you know, trained professionals such as yourselves, misapplication or incorrect application that's not done correctly, you could end up in a situation in which you know, it does knock back some of the workers, but it doesn't provide effective long-term control. The most important thing here with these ants in this specific image was they have an affinity to electric, electrical systems. So these ants would go in, and as you can see, all of the dead ants on these contacts here, these ants would actually go into electrical boxes. And for some reason, they have a high affinity to these electrical systems. They go in and they actually short out the electrical systems. And we'll talk about specifically why that was such a problem here uh, in a minute. Um, but they're also known in several regions of the United States, <clears throat> in many of the states where they've become infested. They move into these areas where they can infest a few acres uh, at a time and completely overrun that area. And they've actually been implicated in devaluing real estate. So ecological impacts and concerns are obviously a major issue, financial concerns, and then also damage to structures. You know, and, and in terms of the ecological impacts for ants like this, the image on the right is actually a picture of yellow crazy ants. So a different crazy ant species than specifically what we're talking about here, which just illustrates that these individuals, when they move in, they're incredibly aggressive foragers. They can move in and they will feed on pretty much anything. So if you have native uh, reptiles, native bird species, particularly those that nest on the ground, um, ants just like this are incredibly problematic and very threatening to these. It can also completely overrun uh, native ant species, which makes them a big concern as well. <clears throat> so the challenge with this ant species was that traditional management strategies using a, a high kill contact insecticide um, were pretty ineffective. You can actually see here, again, this is from uh, the same site that we looked at earlier. You can see where the band of that liquid product was sprayed across there. Um, that line there where you're seeing uh, the darker brown is dead worker ants, dead tawny crazy ants, and then the left of that is the concrete that was untreated. So you can actually see where these individuals were dying on top of that treatment. Looks great from uh, an aesthetics perspective. You've visually got this uh, this appearance that there's a high kill there, but the total number of workers is so incredibly high that it may provide a short-term solution, but it doesn't effectively provide a long-term control. So this was the case here where we knew that ant baits were going to be critical for managing this ant species. Um, so what we wanted to focus on was exactly how to tackle this ant species with baits, because while we knew that ant baits would be the most effective, they ingest the bait, they have the toxicant that's inside that bait, and through their normal social behaviors of sharing food resources and contacting each other regularly, we knew that they would effectively transfer that bait back to the reproductives. Looks great to kill the workers, but ultimately with any ant species, we're always talking about in terms of management, targeting those reproductives. So <clears throat> we wanted to make sure that uh, the, the, the baiting strategies that we developed for this would be effective because not all baits are necessarily created equal for every ant species. In this case, um, one of the baits that was commercially available, it was great for most ant species, but in this case, it was actually killing the workers for the tawny crazy ant too fast. It, was, it had a high palatability, um, but its longevity in the field didn't last very long. So we needed to come up with an, and tease out some potential new baiting methods for this. So the target site that we used was a wastewater treatment facility um, inside uh, in Florida. And the reason why this wastewater treatment facility uh, allowed us to come out there was because of the health impacts that they could potentially suffer because they were completely overrun by these tiny crazy ants. Those piles of dead ants you saw earlier, that was actually from this site here. And the reason why it was such a concern for these tiny crazy ants was because, as I mentioned, they have a high affinity for electronics. These tiny crazy ants were actually going in and shorting out the electrical systems that were responsible for running these wastewater treatment pumps and the other important components inside this facility. So what that meant was you had this entire city that was at jeopardy of not being able to adequately treat, treat wastewater and uh, it leading to some potential uh, major health concerns. So you look at the image here on the bottom right, that's one of the, the pump houses there. You could see these images of uh, where these tawny crazy ants were going in, absolutely overrunning these sites. 
And this was just not even from any treatment. This was just residual dead workers that were finding their way in and just over time, just dying inside these facilities. But you can see this outlet here, these individuals were coming in and overrunning the area. And again, just some more images there showing that they had attempted to try some, some control strategies on their own, uh, but of course those were unsuccessful. High worker mortality, but low long-term success. So what we wanted to do was look at a couple of things. One of the most important things was understand what the consumption rate of these ants was. We needed to be able to make a recommendation that was realistic for the field. Um, so we knew that there was huge numbers of these ants, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of individuals. We needed to understand how much bait they were consuming at a time. So we actually looked at measuring consumption rate. We also wanted to look at the most effective delivery method. So you're seeing on the left here, uh, how we were going through measuring consumption. We would, we would put out a known quantity of bait in a, a series of different bait stations um, one week and then come back five days later and then measure the total uh, consumption of those ants. And the image on the right was um, objective two, which was to evaluate the delivery as well as that dilution rate. Um, you can see here, we actually tested a number of different uh, uh, delivery mechanisms and, and delivery solutions, including even some rotated bait stations uh, from some companies that were willing to work with us to, to evaluate maybe upfitting some of these rotated bait stations. We needed something that could deliver a very high quantity of bait um, because simply a, a smaller bait station just wasn't going to do when you're dealing with millions of workers. So <clears throat> we identified a dilution rate. Um, helped to amend the label for a specific product. Uh, it came down to a 25% dilution rate was kind of the sweet spot for this specific uh, product. Um, and then what we did was we evaluated that in a year over year um, uh, study, looking at when we would put product out. And we intentionally started very late in the season to see what kind of numbers and results that we could get. And you can see here, um, that uh, the blue is the total worker numbers as, and the green is the uh, consumption of that 25% dilution solution. So what we wanted to do is make sure that total ant worker numbers were decreasing in the same time the consumption rate was decreasing. That was telling us that the populations were actually decreasing. Uh, so we were able to evaluate and, and find that kind of sweet spot with this ant species um, and help to uh, eliminate the, the ant colony uh, that was infesting that area through this uh, new diluted uh, product um, recommendation. So the management recommendations that we're able to, to kind of put together for this ant species, um, and this is kind of the same for any ant species. It doesn't have to be this one-off crazy invasive ant species that we're dealing with here. This is the case for any invasive ant species. Early detection and early application and early implementation of those control solutions is always going to be your best bet. With ants, it's always best to be proactive and not reactive. Anytime you're reactive to a situation, especially when it comes to pests, you're most likely going to be kind of fighting that issue, which is the reason why ants typically have one of the highest callback rates of any of the structural pests that we respond to. Um, in terms of chemical controls, uh, the diluted bait was going to be the, the success here, that 25% dilution rate with an ant-specific contact insecticide also used in conjunction with that. So ant-specific just means that it does similar things that that, that bait's going to do. It's going to work, the active ingredient's going to work slowly. It's not going to kill the workers too fast. Um, and it's also eat, it's a non-repellent. So that way these individuals don't know that it's there. They contact the active ingredient and through that normal social behavior, will contact each other and share that active ingredient uh, with other nest mates, ultimately with the, the goal of reaching the reproductives um, and sharing that active ingredient with those reproductives. And then finally, integrated pest management uh, that should encompass your entire ant management strategy, whether it's for this invasive ant or any ant species for that matter. Um, and, and the key here with this specific species, but with most ants, is going to be nest site reduction. Um, with these, it's a little bit more challenging because they're opportunistic. They could pretty much nest under a leaf, but knowing to help clean up debris um, in any other substrate or matter that could be out there, um, whether it's accumulated uh, yeah, uh, landscape materials and things like that, brush, whatever you have that's around the home or around that property, cleaning all that up to minimize the potential number of nest sites that are available. Final takeaway here, um, you know, we mentioned earlier, extended that I'm running out of time, we mentioned earlier uh, the situation with, with uh, Raspberry and his, his efforts to help um, identify this, this problematic ant species. He knew that the behaviors of this ant were different than anything else. He wasn't necessarily an ant expert, 
but he knew and could clearly identify what was abnormal and what was normal ant behavior for the common ants that he dealt with in his area. And he just knew right off the bat, this is not Caribbean crazy ant behavior. This is something different. And he pulled in some local researchers to help him out with that. So be familiar with those native and established pests that you have in your area. Understand what that behavior is, whether it's a rodent species, a cockroach species, an ant species, no matter what it is, know what is normal. You don't have to know everything that is around you. Just be able to understand what that normal biology and behavior is. Then also uh, be familiar with your local identification resources, whether it's you know, some of the fantastic experts that we've had on this presentation today, um, or you've got your local representatives and your distributors, your manufacturers, all of these folks are going to be very important in helping you uh, if you have some identification requests that you need. And with the Thani Crazy Ant, there's still some things that we have left unanswered and some potential implications for invasions. You know, I'm talking about an invasive ant species here that's tropical, but if you look at the global distribution map, you can see here that we've got ants, the uh, pockets of this ant that currently exist um, and have established themselves in uh, up in Canada, over in France, and some other areas um, far north of that tropical line that we typically would think of for an ant species like this. And that's because we've got greenhouses and indoor agricultural facilities around the world. Right? So even in neighboring countries where you're close to right now, this may seem like this ant is world's way, but in fact, you never know when you could see an introduction to this ant species pop up, even in your neck of the woods, purely because of the fact that with these indoor facilities, the temperatures are always conducive for these ant species. And uh, you know how warm it is right now. It kind of feels like it's a pretty tropical environment for you right now, I'm sure. So it feels a little more realistic that a potential introduction to this ant species could could show up in your area um, you know, in, in a decade or two. So it's always important to be aware, never count things like this out. So I know I went a bit quick. I wanted to make sure that I didn't go over too much on time, but if you have any questions, I mentioned some folks that are available for expert identification assistance. I know you've got some great resources through your association. Here's my contact information. I'm an entomologist that also can help you out with some identification questions and things like that. Um, but with that, if we have any time left, I'll be more than happy to take any questions. And again, I just can't thank you all enough for the opportunity to present here today. Great. Thank you, Michael. That was fascinating and so, so interesting. Uh, certainly the invasive species side of things. I've, I've never known over the last five or 10 years, probably just the last five years, just the amount of um, concern there is in the UK in terms of invasive, whether it's mosquitoes or ants. Uh, we, with the Alassius neglectus, the uh, invasive garden ant, I don't know if you have that there, but that's becoming yeah. an issue because it, similar to these uh, crazy ants, the identification is sometimes, you know, different hairs in different places or, you know, slight, you know, tiny, tiny size differences, which can be hard to actually see without a microscope, can't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and invasive species, you just never know when something's going to show up on your doorstep. I mean, with global travel now, nothing's off the table. It's so easy for us. I mean, all it takes is one garden enthusiast to order something off of you know, the Internet that, that shows up in the soil that that plant is in. Or, uh, you know, it's, it's a pet that's ordered from somewhere else around the world that could have ants or something else. Uh, you know, there's a new cockroach species that we're dealing with here in the U.S. that's actually more of a Mediterranean climate than our, our tropical climates that we're used to in the Southern region. Um, mm -hmm. So you just never know when these things are gonna show up. And we're dealing with a tick species right now that uh, does not need a mate to reproduce. So parthenogenically, and it could just, populations yeah. could explode five, 6,000 eggs at a time with no mate. Yeah. So that ain't- Yeah, joy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. It's, uh, I mean, with the uh, Lassius neglectus, I know that it's in Gloucestershire, I think in 20, or oh, no, 2009 when we first discovered a uh, Lassius neglectus, very similar to our more native um, garden ant, and um, they were brought over in a in a plant that was, you know, uh, then uh, distributed throughout the the manor. It's found in a, in a manor in Gloucestershire, uh, and it covered many hectares, many millions of workers, many thousands of queens, and it was, uh, yeah, pretty explosive. So it is noticing things like that, isn't it? I think actually this is not right. This is not. And, you know, a native garden ant. This is something different just by the size of it or, and the electrical sockets, like you said, the Lassius neglectus are very similar in terms of having a strange affinity to <laughs> electrical sockets. So strange behaviors yeah. can help you identify the different species, can't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh. Yeah, just just knowing what's normal out there. And, uh, you know, or you, you're all natural biologists. I mean, you're all naturalists. 
you know, take the time to kind of, uh, you know, when you're doing your normal inspections around the property, take the time to observe things. And that's what you're there for. And you, I mean, you're the boots on the ground. You're the, the frontline defenders when it comes to identifying a lot of these, the first introductions for these invasive ants and, and other invasive pests. So, Absolutely. I've had one question pop up from Paul. Um, he says, does this ant species have any natural predators or disease um, that could be used to reduce the population sizes? So they have found that there are a few viruses that may have some sort of impact. You know, it's really interesting. I said there's a lot of questions left to, to kind of figure out with this ant species. In South America, where it's native to, and it shares an overlapping range with that uh, red imported fire ant, they tend to kind of keep each other in check. For some reason, though, populations can overwhelm red imported fire ants in the U.S., and we're not quite sure exactly why that is yet. So, I mean, there's still a lot of questions that are unanswered. So there are natural predators, you know, like the Tony, the red imported fire ant is one of those, but, and we have it in the United States. We're not quite sure though, why it doesn't successfully keep that Tony crazy ant in check. We're also looking at, you know, the potential for other pathogens because, you know, we have this area where these populations are completely uncontrollable for two or three years. And then for no explainable reason, populations will just crash. And we don't know why. So that that facility that I was talking about, yeah, I mean, we would love to take credit for the decline, but chances are, I mean, there's just some natural phenomena that happens after about four-ish years or so, um, and the populations mm -hmm. just decline in their own, and we, we can't explain it yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we've all been there on times where we think, oh, okay, this problem sorted itself out. I'm not sure why, but yeah. great. <laughs> yeah, we'll take the credit, but we don't know if it was all us or not. yeah. yeah. Of course, of course. Um, uh, Philip has asked another question. Uh, you answered my question as I was typing it out. So thank you for the presentation. Oh, okay, just a comment there saying, uh, yeah, he was typing it out and you got there. So that's great. Um, fantastic. I mean, so there, there are all the questions as always. We, you know, with people logging on today, I know for a fact, so I can see uh, the comments popping up in the chat and how great it was and how appreciative we are of you of getting up so early, uh, Michael, and uh, presenting with us today. And I'm sure we'll be working together soon. So thank you again. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you everyone for the opportunity. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing everyone again soon. So take care and stay cool, everybody. Thank you. Take care, Michael. Bye-bye.